So we have chapter 45 and 46. Um, 45 is MCI and then 46 is bioterrorism EMS response. So we'll get a move on. Oop, what's that up the road? Yep, up the road before the next two weeks. So, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm supposed to go there for a, a class. Ugh. Not enough time in my life. Okay, well, have fun. Let me know how it goes, Jeff. We'll go ahead and get through this stuff um, and be safe. Go ahead and get through this stuff. Oops, one more. Okay, so we're into MCI here, and uh, they have a very interesting uh, perspective on it in this chapter. It's not how I had writ written it, but it is what it is. So we're at 1322 as far as a page, if you have your books. And we're hitting MCI, NIMS, which is the NASA National Incident Management System, triage and treatment. And... Really, um, to declare something uh, MCI really varies based on resources. For example, when I worked in Idlewild, we only had a one, so one station with two units. Um, and one was a primary, which I was on, and then a backup. And then um, they would call in volunteers. So if you had an incident where uh, two cars crashed, which is very common up there, and um, you had, you know, five or six victims that was considered in our response area an MCI. So if it's LA City, that's an everyday occurrence and that's not an MCI. It's just a couple, you know, a few people have gotten an in, into an accident. They have so many resources in LA that it's, it's crazy. So it's not even a blip on their scope, whereas in our area, it's stressed out our whole system having five or six patients, especially if most of them were either moderate or critical. So it's really, really dependent. So, But we still use the same plan and, and approach to it as we would in any, any other incident. An MCI is, by definition, this is their first bullet point is their definition, an MCI is any incident or event that places excessive demands on personnel, equipment, and typically involves three or more patients. Now, if you look at um, Riverside County EMS and how they've defined it, that's a multi-patient incident, MPI, and MCI is over 10. So you're going to go to different areas, uh, meaning county to county, and their definition is going to be different. This definition basically should be aligned with the national definition of an MCI. Okay. And again, it'd be a variety of, it doesn't have to be trauma. It could be, you know, a gas release, sarin gas release, or, you know, um, you know, food poisoning that's really bad um, or some kind of poisoning. So, you should know that the National Incident Management System, we call NIMS, provides consistent approach to managing disasters. So that's really the key on this um, slide here. And we use a, an incident management system that is organized and everybody's it's standardized and flexible. Everybody's talking the same language. How this finally came about is about, uh, it's about 20 years now ago, maybe more, it was about 20 years ago, um, and Jeff could probably correct me um, on this. It was the Walnut Creek fire, um, Oakland fires, where um, finally they called in for mutual aid from the rest of the state. Um, and we got up there meaning our resources and we tried to connect to their hydrants and their hydrants didn't have the same um, couplings, the same threads. So our hoses wouldn't fit their hydrants. Uh, that was just one thing. The other thing was their um, definition or their terminology was not the same either on an incident. So what they called for, they called for an air attack um, and uh, to come in to the to the scene where and uh, start. Uh, you know, working in the um, Walnut Creek area to, to put out fires. Well, an air attack is is a um, flight vehicle, meaning a um, airplane with 
a pilot and somebody inside of it goes back to Berkeley. Yes, 1970. Thank you. Man, time flies when you're having fun. So, um, and, uh, and Jeff brought up a good point. It was the 1970s. Oh, it started with the Berkeley fires. So, um, I didn't think my sister was back there that long. Um, she lived in Walnut Creek. So, what happened was you had, they call in this air attack, and it's really for command and control. It, it's to find out where they should drop stuff and this and that. What they really wanted to say is we need an air tanker. Um, they need to use the terminology and the air tankers are the ones that drop the FOSS check or, or whatever stuff they're, they're dropping at that point in time, water, FOSS check, whatever the case may be. That's what they needed. So they're getting all pissed off because, you know, they're not dropping water on these areas that need it really quickly. And anyway, so the terminology was, had everyone all screwed up also. So finally they came up with a standardize a national incident management system and actually jeff on the other end here um could be teaching this and much better than i i've only involved in you know you know probably about 80 or 90 incidents he's probably involved with a lot more and he's doing that now after he retired from the national park service as a ranger and chief ranger and all this supervisory ranger and responsible for all this so Anyway, so I'm going to have him correct me as I'm going along. But yet again, it's a template. It's a management system. It makes everything much more organized. Now, they bring up Katrina here and, you know, chime in. But Katrina was not an MCI. Katrina was a super big disaster. And, you know, this little – this is just one little um, aid station in the whole scheme of things – I think they're going to have a picture in here. We'll kind of drive home the point on how big it was, hopefully, because they'll show the uh, football field where everybody was, you know, in. Uh, and it was that in itself from the guys that I knew that were, you know, going in and out of there. It was a, it was a real um, nasty place to be. And, and, you know, it was just crazy. So the, the, it takes and uses best management practices to safely make sure responders um, get in, get out, and operate in a safe environment. And you have, you know, objectives that need to be met, usually tactical, you know, resource, use of resources, use of, of your personnel um, to mitigate this big, nasty event. Now, Again, they, they use Katrina, but really what we should be using is like, um, you know, a six person or a 20 person event, um, we, which tends to be um, a little bit more manageable and easy to use. The incident command and ICS and MCI, all these different um, acronyms are being thrown at you. So if you've read the, read the, uh, the chapter, you're going to get a little bit of idea what we're, we're looking at here. So we have a coordinated to use resources. What this gentleman here right here is doing is he's assigning and making sure everyone has um, a piece of the pie and it, it, he delegates out either him or um, whoever he has, you know, probably right behind him. Um, they're working on making sure everyone has an assignment and if they carry out their assignment. I see Bailey has just arrived too. Okay. Cool. And Bailey's here. Okay, so the features of the incident command system, the ICS, is our common terminology, simple English. Um, common designations for all. Uh, it incorporates manageable span of control. <laughs> yes, Bailey, that's the way it is. It's called Murphy's Law. Um, let's see, okay, so... And then you have, you know, manageable span of control and different places. Oh, we like the like one to seven or one to five. And it really depends, you know, on your resources and what you have available. Um, I've worn multiple hats at in large incidents um, from. Um, um, communications, uh, doing the communications plus 
running one of the um, you know triage uh, and, and or and or staging areas. So it just it really depends on the incident, the type of incident, what resources you have, and you again you are going to end up in some kind of uh, um, situation where you're going to probably function in one of these different types of um, um, resources, being uh, one of the people that has a position of, say, triage unit leader, for example, or um, medical group supervisor, which is probably the most common I've, I've used or been used by um, and done. So we have distinct titles. So any incident action plan that identifies objectives, you need to be able to accomplish. And what you've accomplished you report to whoever's above you, let them, hey, I've accomplished this, it's done. And depending on the resource needs, you may be reallocated to something else or to another position. So, and again, it really depends on what kind of incident it is. Um, communications, communications is super, super important that we're, they're integrated, that we know who we're responsible to. And um, and know who need we need to you know ask for resources, and everyone is accountable for what what they're doing in an in an incident, because really you're dealing with people's lives, right? So in the incident command system, designated ICS sections, and this this right here, you're going to be really for a large, huge incidents, and this is. Um, um, not uncommon in you know very large incidents like the fires that happened up north where it went through uh, I think it was Grass Valley uh, and or um, Katrina and or you know you name the incident so very large incidents where you have to have some command finance administration logistics operations and planning because the incident's going to be sustained and all encompassing and huge so. Um, for example, on one instance I was on, it lasted for several days. Well, you're going to need rest. You're going to need to eat. You need to go to the bathroom. You're going to replenish resources, blah, 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 blah. So on and on. So you can see that you and your partner, let's say on an ambulance or a squad, you get sent to something on an emergency basis. And we have our little codes in Riverside County where they say, hey, you know, these this incident has met this criteria, you know, and you're going to get dispatched. Be advised, you're heading to this incident. Make sure you have your out of county assignment bags because you're going to be gone for a while, or potentially can be. So, um, just saying, um, or you might end up on an ambulance strike team um, going to Northern California for some big incident. So, in your book, you'll have this. This is the um, EMS branch. You have an incident commander, an operation section chief, an EMS branch director. And again, this really depends on how big the incident is. Um, those top three might be one person or two. And then you get into triage unit and they oversee the triage unit leave oversees triage to personnel and then treatment and transport and staging and morgue unit. So this is kind of a, uh, a small and really good um, one that I've operated under, um, you know, many times on some large incidents. And then if you have the everyday small incidents, five or six people, you know, you don't you wear multiple hats. So you'll end up coming on scene and doing the triage. Triage is done. And now you, you know, are able to do treatment. And you got people coming in because you're getting more support as you get through. And then. As ambulances come in or transport units or air ambulances come in, you know, you get your trans people off the ground and out of out of the, um, you know, out of the uh, different areas they're being put into, whether it's a red category, a green or a yellow. Uh, and again, we like to try and use the most experienced or senior personnel um, at the scenes. Um, and, and the reason for that is. Um, I know everyone's going to get experience at some point in time, but in, especially in a large incident, if you don't have an experience or senior personnel that has some background um, or at least has a little bit of um, practice in this, it can be, um, one, very overwhelming um, and very stressful. And you really want to try to limit the mistakes if you can. 
Um, I developed a bunch of sheets way, way back when, like myself and Chief Norris, who lives in Montgomery, Alabama now, um, kind of semi-retired. But we um, developed these cheat sheets that were laminated and we kept with us, and they worked really well. So, um, again, if you can do that, the most qualified really helps. And uh, having a cheat sheet uh, works very well, too. And, and a lot of the uh, – um, the one that kind of comes to mind is a company, and I totally forgot the name of it. The company makes triage kits. They're huge. I purchased quite a few of them uh, for different departments. Um, and they went with the same, you know, the same cheat sheets that we had developed. They had recently had modified them over the last 10, 15 years that Chief Norris and I um, started working and, and putting them into effect. But um, Anyway, so for the EMS units, just because you're going to really kind of be starting out more and probably on an ambulance or you might even start on a squad or with fire service, you're going to be really looking at this triage, treatment, transport, staging and more. And triage, you know, has to be done as soon as it's safe, right from the get go. You don't treat anyone until you've triaged them and get your feet under on what you really have and who, who gets what resources. Transport units invariably take time to get on the scene. And then we have somebody that stages uh, the units so you're not having everybody all a big clot on scene where they cannot get in and out of the scene with their injured patients. We've had that happen. The, For example, the um, Colorado, the Columbine, shooting that happened there where the the two guys or so it was two guys shot up all the kids at a high school way back when um that happened um not only did they interlock each other that they locked their units which was a smart idea they locked their units and left and when they went to start transporting people if you didn't have the person that was ahead of you then you were gridlocked in you couldn't get out. Um, and then, unfortunately, there's a morgue unit, and a morgue does have a very important responsibility to protect the dead and to leave them in the position at which they've been found so their story can be told once they've been investigated by the coroner's office and detectives and, and you know all the other things that go along with that. So the best, the basic EMS organization is an incident commander, ops chief, triage treatment and, and transport. This is the one we use on an everyday basis, small to medium sized incidents. And we're talking the five people is six, the 10, 12. This is what we use every day. I mean, and this happens in Riverside all the time. That's uh, just the way it is. So triage, again, we're sorting based on medical information that you gather from the patient. Triage is determines who gets emergencies care and who, who's going to survive or you're going to make a, a, a difference in their survivability and then which patients regardless of what care they're going to be provided they're going to die so the, we're going to triage them into these different categories and I know it seems kind of cruel every, every time that I've done it you know, especially in the large incidents you know you're going to somebody okay you get a red tag you know RPM respirations pulse motor um, that you have commands are able to follow commands so that's how you triage them and we'll get into that and then you know a, a triage you know there's a little baby is about the age of my kid and his head was split open he was not breathing um there was like 20 something other patients there's nothing i could do he's in cardiac arrest from that severe injury i had to put a black tag on him i'm telling you it was awful hard to do that and when you triage, you have to follow the guide that you're given on triage, which we'll cover. Now, this is the Houston Astrodrome and Katrina, and this is where 16,000 evacuees ended up. This is not a tr this is not a, an event where you can, you know, oh, let's go through and triage. You know, first of all, you don't have 16,000 tags. Um, second of all, this has overwhelmed any resources that is local or in the state of um, Louisiana. Okay, so 
they have to bring in other states. So New York, California, Nevada, you know, every all the surrounding states came in with resources to help out in this thing. And a lot of my friends were there. And some of the stories I'm not going to tell because you just don't want to hear them. It's pretty nasty. Um, some of the stuff that the conditions they were in and whatnot. But this is not a local MCI or multi-patient, multi-casualty. This is a disaster, totally different animal. And I don't know why they put it in here. Cause to me, it's confusing. If you want to put it in, put it in at the end. But um, so triage, you have a primary and then a secondary triage. The primary triage is the first crew or, or units on scene. So if it's a large incident, you may have, a, you may have, it's usually the ambulances. I use EMTs as a medic. If I have enough EMTs to do the triage in a timely manner, I let them do it. If not, then I'll have to help or any other medics will have to help. If we have enough EMTs, EMTs go triage. And then I follow behind and I see a red tag. Um, they give somebody a red tag priority and that's who I'm going to focus on and, and do, you know, basic uh, first aid for them and then move to the next one. For example, airway alignment, um, stopping severe bleeding. And those are the two things you do. And then move on to another person that's red tagged and they need maybe, um, you know, a tourniquet on. Uh, they're breathing fine, but they have a tourniquet. They look terrible. You put a tourniquet, tag them, and go. So that's how it works. And then they get re-triaged um, in the treatment center. Okay? And um, the transportation people come to the, each treatment center and pull from those treatment centers. So um, really, technically, you get a primary, a quick one, a secondary in treatment if possible, and then if I'm coming to your six reds and five yellows and, you know, 10 greens, I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull one red and probably one yellow, but I'm going to make a decision on which red I want and which yellow and how I choose it is airway and breathing, bleeding, those two big things. Um, if I can, you know, get somebody into a hospital with a surgery suite um, on those two, um, just those two situations there, that's how I do it. Take them off, come back for more if I'm needed. So start triage is what we use. These are universal colors, red, yellow, green, and black. Um, it's used for older than eight years of age and who weigh more than 100 pounds. And start triage for this type of patient works very well. Each patient is triaged in less than 30 seconds. Okay, you and if you're a rookie, you're you're not, you know, have a triaged a lot. It probably take you 45 seconds, but no more than one minute. So if you have, if you have 30 patients, and let's say it takes you 30 seconds per patient, you're talking 15 minutes just to do triage. So if that's one person, so you really need to have more than one person out there doing this triage. Tags have to be put in a visible place so when I walk by, I can see that they're red, yellow, green, or whatever, and I can, you know, implement what I need to implement on those types of patients. So here, are the, here are what we use in, we call it RPM. R is respiratory status, P is perfusion, and M is mental status. Respiratory rate greater than 30 or under 30. Perfusion, capillary refill, is it immediate or do they have a peripheral pulse, meaning you can feel it in the radial artery? So all you have to do is feel one pump and then go. That means they have at least a blood pressure of 80, or you can do a capillary refill. Um, I tend to do the radial artery, and there's a reason for that, and I'll get to it in a second. This next is mental status. If they can follow commands, you know, remember, that means they still have perfusion, they still have oxygen, and they still have glucose and their brains are not all messed up, you know, scattered or whatever. So if they can follow commands, if they have a breathing under 30 and if they have a peripheral pulse, then they get tagged um, depending on their injury, either yellow or green. So you get on scene, ability to walk. 
any of the walk, any people, if you can get up and go over to that fire hydrant and stay right at that fire hydrant and do not move, we will get to you as soon as possible. We have to take care of the people that are dying first or, you know, people that, um, you know, we're trying to get people sorted out. So any patient who can walk and get up and go over to the fire hydrant, they're following commands. They can stand up in a vertical position. That means they have a good blood pressure and they can follow commands to go to a fire hydrant. They get a green tag. It's not that we don't want to care for them. We have to use our resources to do the most good for the worst people. Break down again, respirations, um, perfusion, mental status. Now, it used to be it was just capillary refill. Um, I threw a fit over that. And, you know, so we kind of sent out some letters and they added radio pulse. And the reason for that is if you're in a very cold environment, um, your capillary refill might not be there only based on, um, you know, your perfusion, the tips of your fingers because of hypothermia. So, and that's the easy ones are going to go first as a refill. But if you go for a radio pulse and they have a radio pulse, um, you're good to go. It's that they're, you know, they have a radio pulse. It's they have refill. They have they have perfusion. And then the metal status is ask them to do something like squeeze your fingers. This is what your triage algorithm looks like. You should know this. Um, the reason is on the national registry, they do ask. They will ask you one or two questions on uh, how to triage, what they mean, meaning what category and or how you get to that category, meaning in a red, somebody in red, um, they will either have delayed refill, no peripheral pulse, they will not be able to follow commands or the respirations will be above 30. So that's a red, bing. So understanding how to get to these um, reds, green and deceased and yellow um, is important um, to understand and to be able to regurgitate back on the um, downs here. Um, on the National Registry. And again, this is all in your book. Jumpstart is used for pediatrics. Um, Dr. Romig out of um, Florida, she's a super awesome pediatric doc, uh, pediatric intensivist and all that good stuff. And she developed um, the Jumpstart pediatric triage. And I guess um, it, it accounts for the different physiology which they have. So under 100 pounds, under the age of eight is when you're going to be using this. Um, so respiratory status, perfusion, mental status also, but you're going to get a little bit different in that the, the, um, jump start triage is a lot more complex. It's twice as, twice as complex than regular triages for an adult or anyone over a hundred pounds or over the age of eight. Okay. Salt triage, um, it's global sorting, obvious life threats purposeful movement, patient capable of walking. Um, we don't use a salt triage here, though I'm not saying it's not good or anything, um, but it is, a, you know, it is a, another one of those triage or sorting um, type of, of things you could be done. So only life-saving intervention, head tilt, chin lift, arterial bleeding control, assessment of the individual patients, and then treatment and transport. So in salt, um, they add a little bit more. It tends to be more for um, less amount of patients, not as many patients as what an MCI would have. So you could use salt on a like a five or a six patient um, incident. So these are your triage tags, um, colors, and these are what in each of the colors, what would constitute them being a red, a yellow, a green, or in the black. So anyone on scene, whether of a, let's say a traffic collision or um, some chemical exposure where you arrive on scene and it's adult or pediatric that's not ble breathing, they get the black tag. If it's, again, obviously dead, uh, will not survive, meaning that um, they have a, a pole through their chest and it's taken out their liver and taking out their you know, kidney, uh, but they're still kind of moving around and they're, you know, semi-altered. They have this huge pole and you have another 20 or 30 patients to go. 
typically they're tagged black um, as impending death. So here's a, another type of triage tag. I am not familiar with these. Um, myself, Chief Norris, Mark, um, Andrews, and the other guy who brought us into this, we developed the Cal Chief's EMS section tri triage tag. Um, and it's actually been taken over and used by this company um, that sells triage kits and stuff. Um, God, the guy just had a heart attack and he made it and he's doing well. Um, God, I forgot his name, but my brother. Well, anyway, the moral to the story is I've never seen these type of triage tags. The ones you're going to see are a little bit different than this. Um, I don't know where they use this type of triage tag, but it's, if you go and they have these, pretty explanatory by the colors. Okay, so they have it on the arm. They have it visible. They have the color there. So in treatment, you do treatment and usually uh, treatment staging and transport unit leaders make the decision about the priority of the patient. So if I'm running the treatment section, I'm going to have, let's say, the red. I'm going to tell you I need this red to go first, not that red. Um, staging sends up a unit, and the transport leader um, uh, makes sure they get loaded and off the ground, and they all keep records of where that patient's going. So staging unit monitors how many ambulances and what resources um, that they do or don't have available, meaning that it may be an EMT ambulance or they have to put a medic on it, or hopefully it's a paramedic ambulance, but you got to use what you got to use. If it's an EMT ambulance, you can put a greens on the EMT ambulance, get a, uh, an MCI. It's transport units. Again, the accessibility, you may have to say, hey, Units, you drop the person off at the hospital, come back to this scene because we don't have any more ambulances in the area. And that has happened. Communications, uh, wow. Just expect that it's going to be um, a cluster of mishaps and miscommunications and unable to communicate. Um, we use Murphy's Law. And when we did our triage tags, that's how we wrote the, the how we did the triage tags. One, to make it very simple for a rookie to use. Um, so we put how to triage on one side of it very quickly and simple, the RPM. Um, we also made it so if it was wet or rainy that, um, you know, it wouldn't fall apart because they used to have the paper ones. And then we also, you know, advise people to use grease pens or permanent pens um, out there. Um, anyway. So what I'm saying is Murphy's Law expect things to go wrong. So when all the patients have been transported um, at the hospital, you may be asked to help out. You're going to have to let your dispatch know that if if that's even a possibility. Um, I know I have. I've had to stop at the hospital and help out, um, especially because I couldn't get the person off my gurney. And I had to work him on the gurney using hospital resources as well as my own um, under their auspice. So just remember, try not to get overwhelmed. I mean, you're going to have, could have post-traumatic stress with this or cumulative stress. You know, you didn't create the incident. You, there to, you came to help out. You did your part to help out and did what you could. And you should walk away going, you know, at least I made a difference. What if nobody responded to this, you know, or you had really poorly trained people or, you know, at least you can walk away saying that you did your best. And sometimes doing your best every day, you're not going to win the fight every time. I'm telling you, it's like every heart, heart attack and somebody goes in cardiac arrest. I'm thinking, oh, I want to save them. Well, statistically, there's no way. Um, and it's been proven over and over. People die, you know, and hearts give out. And. A heart attack so large that, you know, there's nothing you can do. If you're in a large extended um, incident, rest periods are a must. 
Um, you're going to have to go to the bathroom. You're going to have to eat um, if it's a large incident over time. So, and being able to circulate people in and out. Um, some bad stuff with what happened in New York is that the guys would not come off of the scene and they were there for 24, 36 hours and did not want to come out of there. They had to get ordered out of there. They were, you know, because of the incident and who was under all that rubble and the hope that they had, they would find at least one other buddy's dead, you know, not dead, which, um, you know, 99% of them were, it was more of a, recovery operation body recovery operation and i had guys that responded from here on um you know that flew back east and call me at early in the morning here you know crying and you know tell me what they did we were de- we were kind of debriefing them and it was just it was sad it was very sad because you know you go expecting to rescue someone and it's not it's a recovery um anyway and i won't go into what they saw but it was not good so stay on your task. Um, hopefully your skill level matches it. Um, again, you need to have food and drink and be able to go to the bathroom. Um, and encourage to talk amongst each other um, that are involved in the incident. And if you need, you should have trained counselors be able to talk to you. Most suitable for a 30-year-old patient with a leg amputated below the knee who is awake, able to follow commands, has respirations at 24, and a weak radio pulse. Okay? So it, everyone I know wants to really put them in the red category, but if you go by RPM, you're really talking yellow on this one. Okay? Now, the disaster is, again, exactly what Katrina was, and they should have brought all that other stuff in reference to Katrina and disaster into this area, but it is what it is. The problem is, is you're so overwhelmed, and resources getting there can be 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, the disasters, a lot of we've experienced lately are natural. And there are some man-made, which, like, the shootings that happened in Las Vegas would be one of those almost a disaster because of the amount of people um, that were shot and the amount of resources that were being used. So in disaster management, it's really important to have strong community support and get the, you know, they, they use something called CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. And if you have a disaster and a very large incident, having those people prepped and in the community able to <laughs> assist in a large uh, capacity, their neighborhood or, you know, um, becomes extremely important. Really good pre-planning, um, where to land helicopters. I know I helped in, I actually did one of those search courses. Excellent, Nash. Yeah, they're, they're really good. Um, it, it gives you a starting point, like if you have the big earthquake that's going to happen in, in California, um, within the next 10 years or whatever it is now, they've, they've kind of, um, you know, they're, they're kind of shuffling around and getting very anxious. I don't know if you've noticed in the last couple of years, you know, advertisements on TV, FEMA saying you should be prepared. And there's some other things going on, you know, trying to push more sort of classes. There's a reason for all that. Um, so if the big one does hit, having cert in your neighborhood or home you know, you know what to do and it makes you able to help out other people. And hopefully you'll have, you know, water tucked away and food supplies for at least 30 days minimum. Um, so if everyone would do that, it'd make things a lot easier, but you know, that's not going to happen. So being able to implement your plan quickly and communications is, especially in a disaster like Katrina and some of the others, um, I didn't realize, and I don't know if Jeff's not backing me up, is um, the federal government will black out um, like your sat phones. Um, so you can't use your own personal sat phone. Um, about the only thing I don't think they will mess with is the um, um, ham operators, that those um, doing ham operator stuff. I'll have to ask my um, cousin. He was uh, CHP out of Riverside. 
he's one of those uh, that do the emergency response and um, ham operator and, you know, disaster management. So application of triage skills, if you got, you got to have those, you got to be able to do that if you're asked to. Quick organization, you know, making sure everyone knows what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do, adapt to the plan. There's going to be weird situations. You know, be flexible. Um, make a contingency for, um, you know, shelter and transportation. We've had to use a small bus before in one of our incidents. So it is what it is. Now, what we forgot about or thought about is we really had to make sure no one bled on the bus um because um that's a bloodborne pathogen issue and that brings up a whole other bunch of stuff i'm not going to get into but man we we debated that one for a long time at the county ems and we want to do the greatest good for the most people we can so in an evacuation warning um you know some kind of disaster is coming you're going to have people that are not going to do it it's just the way it is um routes can get jammed so no alternate routes and then again, you know, people need to have some kind of direction on where to be able to plant themselves in a disaster. Always have a backup to back up the backup. Um, and that's my thing. People laugh at me when I say that. Um, but I believe um, in Schwartz's law, which says Murphy is an optimist. Murphy's law is an optimist. And uh, I know it sounds kind of weird. But um, if you have multiple backup systems, um, you're going to get through stuff. Now, you're probably wondering, where did I get that from? I got that from my dad, um, who was a military policeman, and he was really into outer space stuff and NASA and whatnot. And he goes, you know, what makes our system so well, our, our, our rockets, is because they have redundancy. And I go, well, what do you mean, Dad? I'm, he's talking to a 12-year-old. And, and I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, they have you know, three or four functions for each key component of what's going on in that rocket ship. And that's what makes our so, you know, so unique. And so they have different backup systems throughout the whole rocket ship. So it, it um, tends to be more successful. Now, I uh, can't speak to some of the bars they've had later. Uh, I know my dad, what he would say, but um, it's a whole different topic. But um, the point is, you need to have backup systems no matter what you do. So you guys and gals are the next generation. You're going to be taking my spot in sitting in committees and, and people going, Hey, you know, we should do this or we should do that. Um, you know, in this disaster, um, in any type of, um, incident, we need, we usually have a, a standard gathering point. Um, unless it's over a very long period, then you're going to have maybe you know, two or three different um, command posts. Each of those command posts have to talk to each other. You have an A group, a B group, a C group. Uh, a group will be south um, um, south ops near the um, back of the train. Um, B group, you know, middle of the train on the west side and C group on another area. So you'd have these different areas because it's over such a long period or a long area scattered out. Um, don't allow vehicles in route with hospital to communicate with hospitals except in an emergency. So really what happens is all they're going to get is a triage bait, uh, tag that they're red and that they have head trauma or amputation or something. That's it. And the reason for that is you're going to clutter up the hospital, receiving the hospital's communications. So no one's going to be able to communicate. Everyone rides over on top of each other. Now, there's a lot of, you know, psychological impact to disasters. Survivors tend to suffer from a lot of neg negative emotions. Of, they may have some physical effects and they may have, you know, survival's guilt. There's all kinds of stuff. And uh, reactions tend to deepen, uh, be depend on the age. Like little kids can actually revert back to a younger age. It's kind of a weird thing to see. Um, and then anyone with a physical health problem may exacerbate it or any emotional problem, make it worse. If they have any psych history, just to let you know that kind of stuff can happen. Um, families would, you know, need accurate information. Don't 
conjecture, no anything. They need to get appropriate information. Reuniting families is super, super important um, in a in a in a disaster in a large incident. So um, helping people in a disaster, uh, group people with their families and neighbors if possible. So it kind of have some familiarity um, by neighborhood if possible. You know, that's again, you never know. Um, do necessary things, you know, trying to carry out as much necessary and, and normal stuff as they can. Um, provide emotional structure so you, you can get maybe some counselors in there, pastors, shamans, you know, rabbis, whatever that might be able to talk to people and help them emotionally. And um, disasters are a reality and they're unfortunate. So we never give false assurances to anyone. I never do that anymore. You know, I tend to be more of an optimist than anything, and that can get you in trouble. So I, I just say, hey, we're doing the best we can. We're trying. We're doing this and that. Um, but I won't say, yeah, no problem. You know, he's going to survive. Well, you don't know that. I didn't know that. <clears throat> so, um, again, we hope the patients will accept help. Um, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. And, again, Target high risk patients for intervention, those that have a mental health, young kids need help, um, brittle elderly need help, um, and really um, kind of do the best you can, especially in a disaster. It, it, Katrina it was not something that was said and done in a, sh in a day. I mean, it was, it drug on and on. And it took resources, you know, time to get there. And awesome cert courses. So yeah, if you can do a CERT course, please um, do one um, or encourage your family and friends. As an EMT, when you become an EMT, you know, encourage your family and friends to to do that and to to um, take that course. And the reason is, is you know, it's going to help everybody. It gives you a whole different perspective of a, an incident, uh, especially when um, that incident is going to happen. We're just waiting for it to happen. Um, it just is what it is. So, anyway, um, okay. I'm going to start into the next one. Like I said, tonight's going to be kind of short, but I'm going to start into the next one. I'll give you a break in about 10, 15 minutes. Next is terrorism. Again, this is the terrorism course that they have for the book. Um, my partner and I um, <clears throat> have one that's about three hours long. It's really geared for actual pre-hospital, law enforcement, fire service personnel. It's much more in-depth. This one is, is good for an EMT level, um, and um, we'll kind of get into it. Okay, so page 1340, and we're going to cover weapons of mass destruction and the different chemicals, biological, and nuclear things that um, and explosives and incineraries. And I kind of mentioned the other day and the yesterday, the day before yesterday in the hazmat section that, um, you know, we were missing in San Bernardino and Riverside County some ungodly amount of concentrated chlorine, including the wet of the suits to actually um, work with that stuff. So our terrorist watch group, uh, we were all really, really concerned and you know, they were trying to follow up as many avenues they could on really what happened to that stuff and where it went. And as of that point in time, they had no idea where it went. So what I'm telling you is having people with their eyes and ears open out there in EMS, in uh, fire service and law enforcement and watch groups and cert teams and all these different people out there, um, um, both federal, state and local, you know, Everybody communicating. That's what it really takes if you want to try and try and thwart something big. And what we were thinking is they're going to emulate the thing what happened in Iraq, where they filled a, a gasoline truck with concentrated chlorine and attached some explosives to it and blew it up in a in a in a, a open bazaar, you know, where they buy stuff and it killed a hundred and something and you know sickened two hundred and forty six, made them really bad shape. So anyway, enough said on that. So we're looking at personal protect, personal protection stuff, active shooter, and some cyber terrorism. Which, um, you know, that's cyber terrorism. Something they just added um, based before uh, to this book. 
and was it in previous um, chapters. So when you talk about a WMD or a weapon of mass destruction, you're going to be a part of that. You're going to be responding to it. Um, any EMT. Also, when you become an EMT, if you're if you have the availability and potential to um, work for the state, the state has this volunteer EMT paramedic where you get on their list, you know, they get all your information and they can call you up as a volunteer to a disaster or an incident. And if it's a declared national big disaster and all this kind of stuff, um, uh, both state and even federal, then potentially you'll be on their payroll um, as even though you're a volunteer, you could potentially get paid for it if it's a national disaster, declared a national disaster. So you know, just keep that in mind. But you're going to have to have the flexibility and, you know, usually you tend to see single people um, sign up for that kind of stuff um, or people that don't have children that have the flexibility um, um, to do that. So what their intent is, is to cause widespread death and destruction. Um, terrorism in itself is a group trying to push their own agenda and point, no matter what type of group it is, it could be ISIS, could be um, Taliban, it could be um, um, Omen, Rish, Omen Rishkyu, uh, which is a Japanese death cult. Um, we actually had, we were watching over a group that was in South Hemet in the Awanga area, a branch of them there. Um, there's just uh, weathermen, uh, there, there's all types of different nationalities and types and countries and anything. So really what we're talking about is you, you got, there's a ton of different ones with different agendas. So we use the mnemonic C-B-R-N-E. And then we also use be nice. And they can be used to remember the types of weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, that would be something you might get on a national registry test. You know, what does CBRN mean or CBRNE mean? You know, it stands for a chemical release, a biological release, a radiological release, a nuclear release, and explosives. So um, this one's actually a very good one, um, meaning to remember CBRNE. And um, we're gonna go through some of these different types of weapons of mass destruction. And then you have be nice, which is biological, nuclear, radiological, incendiary, chemical, and explosive. So any in any how, any way they can cause death and destruction or illness uh, to push their own agenda, they will. Now, biological are probably the ones that are the hardest, in my opinion, um, because typically they release um, and they take a while to actually work unless it's a toxin. If it's a toxin, it's kind of a different subject and it can work much quicker. But a biological, meaning anthrax, you're not going to see signs and symptoms for a while if it's... Um, um, oh, what's the one? Not salmonella. Anyway, Staphylococcus and terotoxin B. Um, that you know that could take you down in a few hours. But what I'm saying is, you get that kind of a release, and it takes a while for it to work. So if it's any of the bugs, tularemia, anthrax, um, smallpox, that kind of stuff, you know, you get it's you get exposed to it. Let's say on a plane. And then, you know, a few days later, you start breaking out with something. And depending on what it is, it might be too late. Um, anyway, we'll keep going. I'll, I'll be more on that a little bit. So dissemination or, or getting it, spreading it, or hitting their intended targets. Um, the general approach to a WMD incident is the same for a lot of disasters. But there are some differences in that you're going to have multi-casualties of some type. Then you should have this little thing in the back of your head. So we got all these people at the mall and they're all sick or, or dying or something's happening. You know, I wonder if something's in there that's waiting for me. And so that should be on your mind. So the approach to it is uphill, upstream, upwind, much like a hazmat. And then going into the situation requires being 
prepped or geared the proper gear to enter into that situation. Now, the World Trade Center is another disaster, <clears throat> massive, huge thing, and it's an act of terrorism, whereas Katrina wasn't. It was man, it was natural. And so in an act of terrorism, another thing that should be on your mind is, okay, so this happened. I wonder if there's any other devices or things that are planned after everybody from law enforcement and EMS and everyone else is there. Is there another explosion or a plane out there waiting to come in and, and take out responders? which you're, you're typically the secondary targets, okay? And you need to keep that in mind. Uh, okay, I'll break here in a little bit. So pre-hospital response is going to be a little bit different. It's one that you're going to run out of supplies on your little ambulance pretty quickly. So um, we have caches throughout um, Riverside. I think San Bernardino has the same thing where um, fire service and AMR will hook up to these huge trailers and bring extra um, equipment and response um, medical supplies to the scene of a uh, weapons of mass destruction. And depending on the type that you need, you know, you're going to have to ask for it, um, might require a different uh, trailer. So, for example, BLS trailer has all BLS supplies. An ALS trailer with a release of a uh, biological or chemical has a whole another set of supplies for example antidotes for sarin gas um, and um, antidotes not antidotes but treatment for anthrax means cephalosporin um, and other types of uh, biologicals um, and i know where the staging is for at least a few of them because i've been there um, they're in very innocuous huge warehouses where you open the door and like there's rows and pallets and nothing but rows and rows and pallets of stuff that can be put on trailers really quickly in response to a um, weapons of mass destruction um, incident within, you know, less than 12 hours um, and even quicker in, in Riverside and the places I know. Okay, this one right here is an MCI with multiple patients, the explosions, uh, from the bombs that the, the gentleman had planted, again, another terrorist event, using this time using uh, explosives. Medical direction, it, how that works is that they're, they're responsible for how you work in these incidents, and you should have a, a predetermined plan um, on how to respond and what to do. You don't need to be on a phone all the time um, trying to get orders and to care for people, you assess and treat. And in a disaster, you know, your game plan uh, needs to be very simple. It needs to be flexible. And you don't need to be tying up communications, trying to ask mother, may I, you know, put a bandage on someone or, or ventilate someone. So really what we're saying here is that becomes extremely important to have standing orders prior to an incident. There's a bunch of models out there. If you don't have your own, um, you know, I help write some of them. They're easy to get a hold of. I'm going to be doing one up here for the uh, Department of Corrections um, where I'll be working at. <clears throat> um, so your preparation and training becomes extremely important. Now, Jeff is back east. Um, actually in Alabama, the place I was going to be going at, in Anison, where in any EMS, law enforcement, fire service personnel can apply and go to these classes back there, put on by the government free of charge. You know, they pay airfare, meals and lodging and you go through the, the training and then you, you're available to be able to respond to that stuff in a safe manner and, and uh, not end up killing yourself or anyone else. Okay, um, so just secondary effects or attacks, secondary is usually meant for you, so just be aware of that. So you don't want to go into an incident until you've been cleared into that incident. And even if you've been cleared into that incident, keep, uh, keep your eye out for something that doesn't look right. 
keep your eye out and your ears open and your senses sharpened on any incident that you may think is a terrorist involved incident. Um, Cause they're really good about taking out the responders. Um, so the earlier they can figure it out, the better. So you can get people in, set up the incident command system, you know, get a hazmat team in there, get bomb squads in there, you know, get all the specialty teams. So when you walk in there, you don't get blown into a bunch of little pieces or exposed to some toxic uh, environment. So you arrive on scene, you start sniffing, and all of a sudden it smells like garlic or it smells like cut grass. And now you have respiratory distress, dyspnea, cough, burning, you know, eyes burning in your chest. Now you've been exposed to something. It's kind of a little bit late when that happens. So being uh, making sure you're safe becomes extremely important because you can't take care of anybody when you're all jacked up. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here for a little bit. Um, go ahead and take ten minutes, and I'll put that in the chat. Take ten minutes, and we'll start back. So give you a little bit of a break. Okay, got it. Got it, Sophie. Okay, who was the other one? We had some more people join us. We're going to get a break. Joey is here. Yay. Kobe.
They were not your dad. Not on the bed with you, you know where they move to? No, I have your keys. But I didn't touch them. Yeah, there was a bunch of clothing here, but I was going to close They didn't get washed? Did she put them in tonight? Okay. Did you put them in the bag?
Okay, let's go ahead and get back to it. And okay, so HEPA mask is a good thing to wear, but um, it's not really good for toxins. I mean, excuse me, chemicals, um, certain types of very nasty chemicals. It's good for biologicals. Um, the HEPA masks, um, like the N95, they're, they will go down to about, um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, about four or five microns, which will keep out things like tuberculosis and not so much viruses, but a lot of the different larger, um, like bacteria and stuff, like TV and whatnot. Having the glove, gown, eye protection, um, for any type of communicable diseases, remember approach upwind, uphill, upstream. If you can avoid confined spaces, that's a good idea because um, the reason for that is, yeah, go back on. And the reason for that is, is that you get more concentration of the um, whatever is in there, whether it's a chemical or a microorganism or toxin. Um, you're going to get more exposure to that. Any type of leak in your mask um, is going to leave you vulnerable. So stay out of the confined spaces. Only specialized teams go into places like buildings and stuff where there might be chemicals or toxins. And then you should have some prior to, to transport where you're supposed to be going, and hopefully they've been deconned. Um, and like in hazmat, it's usually about a 90% decon. And when they get to a hospital, they'll go through another decon. All hospitals are required now to have um, a decontamination section and negative pressure rooms for such an incident. So your role really is um, start the IC incident command system and size up the scene. And then as people come in and more experienced, um, and the usually the two entities are by law are um, really run the incidents or law enforcement and fire service, depending on what state and what county um, they're in. And those are the two entities. It's usually not the local EMS service 
ambulance service. What you do provide, though, is to start the ICS, you know, part going. And um, as everyone comes in, they get assigned um, some type of a position. We like to do the care and transport as a role of an EMS personnel. So the locations of the event that may be terrorist targets, um, most cities have outlined, you know, potential targets. Uh, the dead from terrorist incidents are considered evidence. Um, any dead person, if they're non salvageable, is it does not belong to you. Um, it belongs to law enforcement, and most, you know, drilling down more is it belongs to the coroner's office or the investigative entity like the FBI if it's a terrorist incident, um, and th that's theirs. That's their property. You move, molest, do anything to that property, you could have a really bad night, a really bad day, um, and find yourself in some big trouble. So just be aware um, uh, of that. And then be aware that perpetrators may be among the injured um, as far as that goes. Now, conventional explosives uh, devices, um, they can burn, they can explode, they have hot gases, they can displace uh, pieces of um, what we call shrapnel, which can be just about anything from nuts, bolts, BBs, ball bearings, pieces of the device itself, and that the blast moves in usually omnidirectional um, unless it's up against the wall, then it will blast a cone shape, um, much like what happened in um, Boston Marathon. That was more of a cone shaped going out towards the street and into the crowd and towards the street. Um, blasts in confined spaces are absolutely worse because they bounce off the walls. So you get not just one blast, but usually two or three where it bounces off the walls versus being out in an open area. So any type of improvised device, um, you can also have, it could be a vehicle bomb, you know, car bombs, um, barrels in a truck, meaning AMFO, which is ammonium nitrate and diesel, and with an, with an ignition source like a, um, uh, a, an explosive that primary that sets off the actual ammonium nitrate and fuel, like a blasting cap type situation. Common explosives, I don't expect you to know any of these or even remember them. Um, they don't usually have them on top outside of a, a terrorist um, bomb saying RDX. Um, or PETN, just know that there are a lot of different types of explosives out there. Um, and, you know, some of them are highly sensitive to shock. Some of them require a blasting cap or a primary explosion. And then the secondary is like the big one. Primary and secondary, tertiary, quaternary, these different things all go with an, uh, an explosion. So the explosion or blast is the primary effect, and then that in itself will create injuries. The secondary effect result from flying debris or shrapnel. It could be the container that was in filled with nuts and bolts, and the debris. Um, it can also pick up debris as it goes around the area and pick it up off the ground or surrounding area and blow it towards you like a desk in you know, wooden desk in pieces. So now you have wooden shrapnel, um, pieces of block, motor, concrete. Um, and then the tertiary effects produced by the propulsion of a person's body. And then quaternary effects are the burn, crush, and inhalation injuries from the explosion also. So depending on how close you are to it, and if it's in a confined space, which is gonna be absolutely worse. Things like blast lung and pneumothorax may occur. So when you ventilate anyone that's been in an explosion, you have to be very delicate when you do that. Um, as far as ventilating, you have to do it slower over a longer period of time, squeezing the bag and be very gentle with 100% oxygen flowing through that bag. 
So it's kind of, you're going to do probably about as half as many ventilations. They say, you know, once every five to six seconds in an adult. So you're going to be looking more in blast lung once every eight to 10 seconds, getting that thing in uh, because it's going to be slower getting it in and letting it go. And the reason because of the damage to their lungs, they're going to have may or may not have altered mental status with, you know, bloody spew, spew from a pneumothorax bleeding out of their ears. They could have stroke like symptoms. Um, blast lung gives you a chest pain, a nasty chest pain. And again, just be very careful with your ventilation and just, you know, you can't treat them like a normal person when you ventilate. Um, actually, some of the best um, uh, training I got was from the Israeli military and the Israeli um, MASH doctors and their um, trauma surgeon in Israel. Uh, my friend and I, I was privy to that and how they care, take care of blast lung. They make a very, very good argument for a really slow and slow flow um, on these blast lung injuries. And then they'll hook them up to a special machine that will ventilate them with very low um, kind of vibrating pressure. It's really interesting how they've, well, think about it. They probably have more, most experience with, you know, people blowing up bombs in Israel from terrorist organizations. Abdomen, you can have bowel it leaks. If any gas is in the bowel, it can cause the bowel to rupture. Um, viscerations from penetrating trauma flying through the abdomen. Eardrums rupturing, inner ear bones may be disrupted. And hearing loss, not only that, they may have vertigo with any type of ear injury. You can have your balance totally thrown off. But you're going to have to carry this person. They're not going to be able to walk on their own if they can walk after an injury like, you know, being close to a, a crush like that or an explosion. Um, structural collapse on people. And again, um, you know, having a building on top of you, you're not going to do very well. The shrapnel injuries, the explosion will send those pieces of shrapnel and surrounding stuff at a very high velocity. That means the canister that blows up, plus any rock or debris or stuff that's in front of it, like a wood, whatever, or a trash can, um, it can accelerate also, and it becomes shrapnel in pieces that will go at a high velocity and cause injuries to people. Incendiary devices, when they detonate, primarily cause burns. Um, so again, use your rule of nines. Airway and breathing is your big issue with burns. You can dress the burn areas uh, with clean dressings and get them hopefully to a burn unit, if not a trauma center. Again, chemical weapons. Um, in the classes I took with uh, Department of Justice, FBI, and a bunch of other agencies, the dispersal of uh, chemical weapons would be more like some kind of aerosol device more than it would be a, um, a military munitions. So it would be a homemade aerosol delivery device. And again, the, tense, the, the agent evaporates and creates a vapor that is volatile. And it's going to be dependent on you know, what it's mixed with and how persistent it is and how volatile it is, meaning how it evaporates based on temperature. So types of chemicals, nerve agents, vesicants cyanide, pulmonary agents, riot control agents, and um, toxic industrial chemicals. So if you can't, you know, make a nerve agent, you can sure find stuff within the environment that's toxic that you can spread out or explode and distribute that way or aerosolize. Um, and they're looking for all different types of ways of, of being, um, being able to disperse stuff. The nerve, nerve agents um, are very similar to pesticide. And the type of pesticide, which you usually don't see anymore, um, thanks to the EPA, and, uh, and I'm being not, not nice about it. It's supposed to be, I thought it was pretty decent, but evidently they, they feel it's worth, not worth having around anymore because of environmental impact. Um, but the ones that um, really work on the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, they're the uh, malathion-type groups, 
Um, and you, you just don't see those around anymore. You see other types now, but it's not that it can't, you know, they don't have probably sitting in some warehouse somewhere, some few gallons of it that could be concentrated and used. Um, I have seen some malathion not too long ago in uh, somebody's garage. <clears throat> and uh, again, I don't think you can see it on the shelves anymore. At least not that I can remember. So what this does is it causes your acetylcholine to stay within the receptor site and it overworks the receptor site. So you have this overstimulation and then your glands. So you have, uh, to know somebody has this type, um, I haven't seen it for a while been quite a few years but it's called sludge salivation lacrimation urination defecation meiosis uh, and basically your exposure to it causes the, the neurotransmitter um, doesn't let it being acetylcholine being broken down the the enzyme is called acetylcholine esterase so if that's not doing its job then the transmitter just stays in there and keeps creating a problem these are the ones that were military grade Tevins, Seren, Soman, GF, um, VX, and then the Russians, nerve agents, Novichoke agents, um, which are very, again, similar to the agents that we show the Tavin and Seren. Now, supposedly, our stockpile, except for what they use at um, Anison for training, um, is kaput, supposedly. And um, it's been destroyed, so who knows? <clears throat> so if you have an exposure to a nerve agent, just remember sludge, and that's kind of what they're talking about here. Small exposure, the runny nose, dyspnea, pupil constriction, which is meiosis. A large exposure, you know, seizures, apnea, secretions everywhere. Um, and it's just, it's a mess for a vapor. Liquid, same thing. So you die of respiratory failure and lots of secretions everywhere, um, bronchoconstriction. And again, there's sludge, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastresis, emesis. And then there is uh, the constricted pupils as well. That's a result of the acetylcholine. Now, emergency care is, you know, if it's a vapor, get them out in an open area. But again, you don't want to get exposed. We use atropine and prilidoxamine, which is 2-PAM-CL. Um, <clears throat> and what these do is the atropine combats, um, the um, uh, counteracts the effect. The prilidoxamine is actually used to attach and drag it out of your system. So we use lots of atropine, and hopefully you have some 2-PAM-CL. <clears throat> the military carries this stuff. Um, Civilian service now, uh, it's called a uh, um, duodo kit. Um, it used to be the old Mark I kits, but they stopped making those a long time ago. So it's the uh, duodo. They're not cheap. Um, so to combat seizures, you'd have to add lorazepam, diazepam, if that's not included in the duodo kit. The seizures are very um, common. Now, besicants, these are blister agents. And they basically do damage by um, attaching to your skin. Um, you have sulfur and nitrogen mustard gas, lewisite and phosgene. Lewisite is the military-grade stuff and phosgene. And so people can make this stuff. Um, there is a book that used to be out. I don't know if it's still there. I know if you search for it and get into the Anarchist Cookbook or the little black book, that they have out there, you're on a watch list from then on. Um, so I know my name was out there for a while because um, as I was going through the FBI classes and Department of Justice and all these different classes and with a SWAT team, um, I was actually writing a, a book for EMS personnel on these, you know, addressing drug labs and, and response to drug lab, drug lab training. And actually, I haven't finished it. It's pretty, pretty interesting, pretty um, in-depth. And it's what every SWAT medic needs to know about um, response to these things. Um, so, again, this what happens is you get this redness and burning. And then anything it touches, it causes necrosis, means it kills your skin or tissue. 
So um, some of this too, you know, they make it sound like it happens immediately. Sometimes it doesn't. It takes a while for some of that. Then if it gets in your eyes, you'll develop ulcers on your eyes. If you suck it into your lungs, you'll develop scarring and wheezing and pulmonary edema in your lungs. Um, and then the fatigue is from hypoxia. So all you can do is irrigate, irrigate, um, you know, get that chemical off, uh, and again, apply dry stress dressings to anything that's been uh, it's been attached to. And lewisite, um, an arsenic-based agent, has an antidote called dimethylcapril, dimethylcapril, capril, um, and um, I don't know who carries that. I don't even know if it's available to the public. It may be more something military. Um, if anyone else has been in the military and knows, I'll have to ask Ron. He would know. <clears throat> cyanide, um, it's hard to get. There's sodium, potassium, calcium, cyanide. Um, it's in crystal form. And what it does is if you take that and it's hydrochloric acid, it liberates gas. And that's what they used to use in the gas chambers. You'd have uh, underneath uh, the person strapped in a chair in a chamber, and you have something that released the pellets into a, a bottle of hydrochloric acid, liberated a gas, they end up you know, dying from asphyxiation. Um, and again, it, we had two deputies that they went to bust a place in Anza, a, a lab they didn't bring us with them, which uh, was their mistake. And the lab was protected by a similar setup where if they open the door, you didn't know about it, didn't open it the right way, knock the crystals into the hydrochloric acid, and voila, he had instant gas chamber, killed one of them and um, messed up the other one pretty bad. So um, this is all the stuff that it does. Um, just basically, the person will turn purple from about here up, about the neck up, uh, because it blocks the use of oxygen. Um, you can actually have a heart attack because of the lack of oxygen to your heart, so you end up with a nasty heart attack going along with them. Um, and anyway, the cyanosis is pretty impressive. Now, the, the, we carried, uh, on our spot team, we carried the nitrate sodium theosulfate. Um, the nitrate's called um, um, amyl nitrate, and sodium theosulfate um, causes will lock onto the cyanide and pull it out of your system. And then hydrocobalamin, it's actually a vitamin. Um, and we give that to pulmonary agents, phosgene, nitrogen compounds, and they're just designed to inhale and cause lung injury. And then you get severe secretions, crackling, strider, um, wheezing, uh, tearing up, a lot of secretions. They're coughing up copious amounts of stuff. And really all this does is airway management. You may even have to intubate the person if they get exposed to a pulmonary agent. Now riot control agents, CN and CS, cry now and cry sooner. We used to use those in fair rounds and, and other devices for delivery. And basically um, they're tear gas or pepper spray. They're an irritant to the eyes, nose, respiratory tract. Just be aware if you're in a situation where this stuff is around or being used or, you know, whatever, if anyone has any pulmonary problem like borderline COPD or if you have one of your partners has a history of asthma, anyone has asthma, you get a whiff of this stuff and it's going to set you off. So your partner is going to have severe difficulty breathing if they have a respiratory, uh, any type of respiratory problem. <clears throat> toxic chemicals can be anything, any type of toxic chemical. Um, I mean, just, you know, think of anything out there that would be, you know, transported by a tractor trailer and they can get and divert it. All you have to do is put some uh, an explosive on it, drive it into a crowded uh, um, like swap meet thing in downtown Riverside and explode the thing. And man, you're gonna have hundreds and hundreds of patients. So <clears throat> same with microorganisms, you know, they can they can go through and spread those things without being detected, really. Um, 
the one of the worst case scenarios is being on a plane and having somebody with a contagious like smallpox. Smallpox is the one that gives me nightmares because smallpox by it in itself, if it's not been modified, smallpox will kill about 30% of the people that come in contact with it. And then supposedly Russia has a um, smallpox that has been uh, modified at, at vector um, and it has a 90% kill ratio. Um, and the and the, the vaccine doesn't work for it for the current smallpox. So you'd have to make one for that, which more than likely they have um, and would immunize, immunize their population, I'm assuming. Um, so you have groups of biological agents, the pneumonia-like, encephalitis-like, biological toxins, and then other agents. So the pneumo, pneumonia-like or anthrax plague of tularemia, if you look at Tulare County or tularemia, that's where that comes from. The rabbits up there can carry tularemia. Plague usually comes from rats or even uh, ground squirrels. I know they have um, plague positive or bubonic plague positive um, um, oh, up at uh, just above Hemet, Turkey Creek Campground, the, the little plague infested rodents up there that run around like to run through your camp. They have fleas that actually are positive for plague, even though I think there's only one person that I'm aware of in the last several years that have actually gotten the plague because they're messing around with uh, <clears throat> messing around with them somehow. I don't know how the story went. I know they showed up at Hemet Hospital and the doctors were all excited. Their first and only you know time they've ever had plague. So encephalitis, like smallpox and Venezuelan, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, all these can be used as um, nasty things to distribute through a, through a uh, population. Um, you hear about anthrax, anthrax letters, anthrax in the news. The biggest thing with anthrax is early detection or, or a suspicion and getting on a cephalosporin right away. Because if not, when you start having pulmonary symptoms of anthrax, um, you basically 90 to 100 percent mortality rate. Botulism is botuli botulina toxin, and um, basically it's you know people would get it from canning improper canning, and the botulism the would you know the live microorganism during its um, production excretes the toxin, and that's what kills you the, the toxin. Enough the size of the head of a pin will actually kill you. That toxin is that deadly. There is, they, they were working on a botulism um, antitoxin. Uh, I, hopefully it's done by now. And they were also working on one for, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's five of them now, antitoxins for botulism. And then there's, they're working on one for anthrax, not anthrax. The one with the castor bean. Anyway, I'll remember it. So ricin, that's it. So they're working on a ricin antitoxin. Um, it's it's similar to what you would get if you got a snake bite. You get the um, anti venom. Well, they're doing trying to do the same thing with ricin, is making an antitoxin or an anti venom type situation for ricin. Ricin's easy to make. It's from the castor berry bean. Two beans have enough ricin if they're rendered properly to kill. Um, FDA to kill um, a person, and that's only two beans. And it was there was a famous case where a Bulgarian uh, guy was um, uh, radio talk show was talking smack about the Bulgarian Communist Party, and they ended up injecting this little pellet. Um, he went and lived in England with this little pellet of ricin, the size of a BB. And it took Scotland Yard a while. The guy took about three days to die, and they finally found the BB in the back of his leg. Um, it was injected by a umbrella that was modified to inject this little pellet into the guy. So pretty famous. You can look that one up. And thank you, Kinsey, for sending that out. I'll, I'll look up, look at that. <clears throat> and there's staphylococcus enterotoxin 13. This one and 
Staphylococcus and Terotoxa B was the one I got at the FBI in our training. Uh, we had to figure out how to make it and do all this kind of stuff. And um, basically, I told my five guys, hey, you know, really easy to make this stuff because I was a pre at Cal State. Is We'll just get one of the um, out of um, out of production um, wineries up north and take over the winery, buy it. And then you can use those vats and actually make this stuff. It's stable in water. You can't kill it with chlorine. You can't kill the toxin with um, boiling it. And it's just the nasty stuff. So anyway, um, this is all the stuff that it does as far as signs and symptoms. I don't expect you to know that. Here's another toxin. More toxins. And just remember, you're going to be asked about a biological versus a toxin. A biological like um, anthrax or um, smallpox, that agent is what causes you to be sick and can kill you. In a toxin, it's not alive. It's a byproduct of a nasty bug that excretes that as it's um, replicating. It's, it's kind of like it's um, urine and fecal matter in a way. So it's a toxin, a byproduct of their growth. Um, anyway, so know the difference in what a toxin versus a biological is. Cholera, uh, that's actually a, a very nasty thing to get. It's still very prevalent throughout third world countries. There are viral, viral hemorrhagic fevers. You've heard of some that were brought to the United States from Africa and then created some problems um, with certain people not doing their level four containment stuff as well as they should, which good lessons and good practice, um, but, you know, good way to get killed. Um, level four containment, there was up to about 20 years ago, there was only two or three of them in the United States that were level four containment. And one was at uh, USAMRID. And the other two are at different. Um, one was another base, an army base, and another one, army base hospital, and another one was um, some big medical center, I think in Texas, if I remember correctly. But anyway, um, moral to the story is, you know, if they have a big outbreak um, of any hemorrhagic fevers, um, especially on the level of Marburg or um, some of the others, uh, you're going to have some problems. Um, getting people taken care of brucellosis. So again, there's lots of different biological agents and really most of our care is supportive. And if there are things like smallpox, plague, Ebola, Ebola and Marburg are very similar. They're highly contagious. You've got to have your totally encapsulated um, protection on. You have to know how to don and doff your protection safely so you don't content, cross contaminate yourself. Um, so, taking care of a Marburg or Ebola, um, I've done level um, two uh, containment people, um, but I've never done a level three or four. And a level four is like totally you take your time, put it on right, take it off right. Um, take it off is where the problem is going to be. If you don't do it right, you can get an exposure. I still have a program I wrote for smallpox vaccinations for him at hospital in my computer here. That's kind of interesting. Hope I never have to need it. Okay, so now um, there are, again, I talked, I said there are these huge um, places where all this stuff is, or bioterrorism is contained. They will send this stuff, antibiotics and antitoxins, two incidents that have, of a breakout. So let's say a little old city of uh, Corona, or I don't know, anyway, it's not a little city, 300,000, but a certain city has a, an event. <clears throat> and so we would ship all that stuff in there. We already have, at least at Murrieta, a plan that I helped with on where it's going to be distributed and how people will get it and um, you know how, how to make sure that um, everyone gets their immunization. 
click on the weapon of mass destruction agent below that is a biological agent. C would be a biological agent, biological. Phosgene is a chemical nerve agent, so it'd be ricin. Three primary mechanisms of death for radiation, blast, thermal burns, and radiation. The thing with radiation is that um, to get enough radiation, it has to be a lot of rads. And if you get a burn from that, a thermal burn, you've had so much radiation that you're probably not going to do very well anyway. Um, and radiation, uh, if it is a blast, yeah, there's going to be contamination. Um, if it's a dirty bomb, there'll be the explosive with attached to it, some radioactive source. The only thing I can think of they might be using or try to use would be medical grade stuff that is um, comes from the hospitals. Um, and they would have to be somebody would be totally on the inside, a big network to get a bunch of that stuff to do this. Um, and a lot of them are actually being watched anyway. So energy goes through you or can get in you. So if you have an explosion, the dust you suck in, can be alpha or beta radiation, and that's where it's going to be bad is getting into your airways. Um, and you can end up, once it's on the inside of you, that's where it starts doing the damage. Um, cancer of the uh, um, thyroid. So you would take potassium iodide for a couple of weeks, to keep um, potassium iodide in there. So the um, Radiation doesn't it attach itself to your thyroid to your thyroid cancer. The problem, if it is inside of you, then you need what's called Prussian blue, which is a IV chemical, and it's actually blue looking like blue milk. And it it will in fact take radiation out of you if it's been ingested. So anyway, the moral to the story is you gotta have access to this stuff if you're exposed to radiation. And here's some of the things we kind of talked about, some of the signs and symptoms. I think in the hazmat and um, the cells start to die. Radiation is causes mutation. Radiation will also kill your fast growing cells. The worst radiations are most penetrating are the ones they list in the middle, bullet point, x-ray and gamma. Um, and then neutron is the most powerful. Um, and then those would be more for your nuclear bombs. So it's super important that you have time, distance, and shielding to protect yourself from radiation. So if you're responding to anything, you're going to be staging a ways away from that. Your beta radiation and low speed, the particles um, can be stop, easily stopped six to ten feet in the air, stopped by clothing, a few millimeters of skin. But again, if they get into you, you inhale or ingest them, that's where it becomes a problem. And the same with the alpha. Alpha radiation is heavy, slow moving, easily stopped, but again, inhaled or ingested. So that's where if you had a dirty bomb and you have all this dust flying around or any, anything that's aerosolized in the air, that's where it's going to become a problem. So hopefully we won't experience a nuclear explosion um, because the primary exposure is your radiation and blast injury in the detonation site, and then the fallout is what spreads out away from that blast area, um, and the dust and particles will be life-threatening um, as you inhale them or are exposed to them. Um, if you want Google, you know, nuclear blast, you can see them on YouTube. Um, they're pretty impressive. Um, and then, again, you can have uh, conventional explosives with a bunch of stuff attached to it we call a dirty bomb the wind blasts 160 miles per hour and then the heat is incredible you never want to look at the blast because it's like looking at the sun it'll do eye damage all right went through dirty bomb improvised nuclear devices um we keep talking about a low grade, what they call a suitcase bomb. Um, I, I did 
We have radiation detectors, I'll just say around, that's all I'm going to say about them, uh, to detect anything that may be moving in and out and around. Um, there was a incident um, trying to coming in from Canada, came through the coast, through Canada, trying to get into the U.S. of a nuclear warhead um, a few years back. That's all I can say about it. Um, and it was thwarted, thank God. But the threats are there. You know, they're, they're real, and you have people looking out for you. Uh, but it really takes the whole tribe of all of us keeping on our toes, keeping our ears and eyes and open. Most of the destruction of death is near that blast center, the epicenter of the blast. And the rest of them from outside the blast areas from fallout. And that's all the signs and symptoms that you're seeing now having to do with killing off your bone cells, your fast, fast growing cells of your gastrointestinal system. You can't make red blood cells, can't make platelets, can't make white blood cells if radiation has wiped them out. Okay. So protecting yourself is time, distance, and shielding. If you remember those three things, times, distance, and shielding. Um, if you have, you know, Iodine tablets can help protect against and it's potassium iodide long-term radiation effects. You can get them at Walmart. But anyway, um, the moral to the story is that only protects you from thyroid cancer. If you get it inside of you, you need something else. And that's what comes in these huge stockpiles that the federal government has set aside. I would venture to say that most places, unless you're in a hazmat unit, you know, don't have really good protective equipment against nuclear um, penetration um, as far as that goes. And then if you're working in that kind of environment, typically you're going to be working in level A, level B type suits. Um, specialized, um, they call Siebert teams. We have a very good one in Riverside County. It's out of March Air Force Base. The Siebert team there is outstanding they're probably one of the best around they're well noted um and they're um they are available to an incident you know if you ask for them there's some strings that could get pulled to get them out to help out um if there's an incident tactical ems we call them tems tactical ems teams um it's not tarp normally tarp taught as part of EMT and paramedic curriculum. Um, once I get my curriculum up and running, I will have a component taught by a bunch of us that have been tactical medics, um, including military and law enforcement guys that are all tactical medics. And, and we'll attach that as an extra course. So um, as far as tactical medics, um, the guy I helped and worked with actually runs um, a, a business in Palm Springs and in um, Northern California, more specifically the Sacramento area. His name's Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence High School. You can actually Google him and he um, actually runs a really good tight ship and a very good team. Cyber terrorism, all I can tell you about that is that, you know, it has to do with going after our infrastructure, trying to shut down um, our Grids from power grids, shutting, you know, going into our banking system, you name it, they're trying to go after us, you know, from North Korea to um, terrorist, er, um, terrorist group, Muslim groups that are terrorists, not just the, you know, the outward ones um, like ISIS and Taliban and whatnot. And then, you know, the communist states tend to want to go after us and try to in, screw up our inner structure. So anyway, it happens all the time. Um, they're always talking about it um, as far as that thing goes. I don't know a ton about it. Oh, that's about it as far as I know. And there's always a lot of um, work uh, from the military or the government section to try and limit their um, and thwart their attacks to our structure. Okay. Okay, let me. Um, yeah, thank you. 
for that. And I'm gonna copy that. No, oh, I can't. See if I can link to it. But anyway, um, there isn't any questions. That's it for lectures. Um, if you want to email me, text me, or whatever, if you have any kind of questions. Um, I know we're pretty early tonight. Those were actually kind of short as far as compared to some of the, the lectures you've had that are pretty big, like pediatrics and the assessment section. So anyway, okay. If nobody has any questions, have an awesome night. And um, you're at the end here, right at the end of your class last week or two. And, you know, you'll be graduating. And remember, take the National Registry test within a week or two of graduation. And you're going to do way better than waiting. Uh, those that wait, especially after four weeks, have a 50% fail rate for the first time. So my suggestion is first week or two, jump right into it or get it scheduled, you know, now or as soon as you can. Anyway, have a great night and we'll be talking to you. Oops. Ah, oh, beautiful. There you go. Yep, there you go. There's the antitoxin there. Thank you very much. And I'm going to save that puppy. Yep, that's one dialed woman.